Sure. So, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. And I'm very extremely sorry for the issue that we had with the link in the Zoom. So, um, but anyway, the uh, lecture will be in recording mode. So, first of all, I welcome our today's speaker, uh, Dr. Luca, who kindly accepted um, our you know invitation to be one of the speakers for today. And uh, it was like great uh, to have you here, uh, Dr. Luca. I know that you are very uh, regularly visiting India for different projects and other things. So I feel like it's an honor for me to uh, you know host you today. And uh, just to, to give an introductory, actually, uh, these uh, monthly lectures have been started as a cut and riser event for our conference, uh, 12th uh, ISFMG 2026, which will be held in IT Indore um, in August 26. So as a part of the conference, we started our activities. Uh, so with this uh, monthly activities and from the second uh, week of February, we are going to have some uh, podcast also. Uh, so this is our fifth lecture of TC220 of ISMG. So I take this as a, 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 a honor to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Luca, who is Associate Professor at OsloMet and Senior Researcher at Norwegian Geotechnical Institute. His scientific pursuits primarily revolve around slope stability analysis, rainfall thresholds, early warning system, risk assessment, and tiling dam stability analysis. With a portfolio of national and international research and diverse, including scientific significant involvement in EU projects and over 20 impactful scientific papers, Lucas' expertise is highly regarded in the academic community. His contributions extend beyond research as you know, he convened sessions on landslide early warning monitoring at renowned conferences like EGU and WLF. Additionally, uh, Lucas serves as a distinguished expert advisor uh, for START Forewarn and is a member of executive committee of the International Network of Land Away. Uh, furthermore, he is a member of the technical committee of tiling and mine waste of the ISMG. So with this brief introduction, um, I welcome you again, Dr. Luca, for this lecture series, and thank you again for accepting to be our uh, fifth speaker. So, over to you. Thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Nilima. It's, it, it's actually an honor for me uh, to present what uh, we are doing uh, in this series of events that you are arranging online, that kind of our preparatory event of the symposium that you're going to have in 2026. So thank you very much, uh, and I'm, go I'm going to share my my screen, and I hope and I I I uh, hope you can get, give me a feedback uh, if you see it. Okay, I got the feedback from Minu. That's actually in the room. I am uh, at uh, NGI offices at the moment in Oslo, as Nelima was saying. I, I am. 70% uh, at, uh, at NGI uh, as a researcher, a senior researcher. And also I recently started a position uh, as associate professor at the University of Oslo here, uh, dealing with uh, and uh, having the course on environmental uh, geotechnics. Today, uh, I'm gonna describe what we have recently done uh, this uh, fully operational IoT-based real-time slope stability analysis that we are using as a tool for a local lens of early warning. So we are going to uh, see how we have implemented uh, this uh, real-time slope stability analysis in a case in a case study. First of all, before starting, as you can see on the bottom right, you see a fruit there, a peach. Well, the point is that my surname is not that easy to pronounce, not even for Italians sometimes. So to help you understand and remember my name, I put here the pitch. So the correct pronunciation of my surname is Picciullo. So just remember the fruit, the pitch, and then it's easy, Picciullo. So um, after that, I think we can start. And I would start from... Um, a, a definition that I like uh, about early warning systems. So we start with that and then we build uh, on top uh, with all the other uh, topics and, 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 and things. This definition is general. It, it's about early warning systems. I like it because it has 
is it's from the United Nations International Strategy, Strategy for Disaster Risk Reduction. It has in it all the main keywords. So an early warning system can be seen as the set of capacities needed to, to generate uh, and then, of course, disseminate a timely and meaningful warning with the aim of inform individuals, communities, or system managers, uh, or in general, elements that are threatened uh, by a hazard to prepare and to act in time to reduce the possibility of harm and loss. So we understand here that it's a group, a set of capacities with the aim of providing a warning that has to be timely to inform, to inform individuals, communities, to reduce the risk or system managers. But what's the role in the lens like this framework? I'm using this uh, framework from uh, Fel et al, 2005, it's pretty famous, and early warning systems can be seen as risk uh, mitigation options. So if we think at the formulation from VARPS, so the risk uh, as hazard times the vulnerability times the element exposed. Well, what early warning system systems do, it basically they reduce the risk by reducing the element at risk. So they are non-structural risk mitigation measures. Then you may have structural risk mitigation measures that they go, for instance, uh, they aim at reducing the risk, either reducing the hazard. For example, you do some mitigation measures in order to reduce the whole water, uh, the whole water pressure or the water table, and you are reducing the probability that an event may occur. Uh, on the other hand, you may build something, uh, some walls or other things, or reinforce the element exposed, and in this case, you are reducing the vulnerability. Remember that the vulnerability, it ranges from zero to one, where zero uh, is, um, uh, is no loss and one is complete is complete loss. So reduction vulnerability means reduction in, in the risk. But risk early warning systems are non-structural risk mitigation measures, and the aim is to reduce the element at risk. These systems can be employed at two different scale of analysis, slope scale. And here I refer, and I call them local labs, local lens and early warning systems. In this case, are all those systems addressing single lens sites uh, where we know more or less, we have a good understanding of where the sliding surface is. On the other hand, at a regional scale, we are dealing with systems operating over wide areas, dealing with the possible occurrence of landslides, multiple landslides, but we don't know exactly we, the, the, the location. And we don't know exactly the, 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 what is the depth or the sliding surface. And I refer to these systems as territorial landslide early warning systems. On the top, you can see some examples for a local labs on the bottom you can see some example of territorial labs uh, an example is rio de janeiro it's pretty famous more famous it is the one uh, the system operation in hong kong uh, the, between slope scale and regional scale also the instruments involved and what are kind of uh, uh, the variables you are monitoring for issue warnings are are different well, another thing that I have to say is that territorial, also the word territorial, because they include systems that may be employed at uh, a basin scale, municipality, at uh, in a province, in a region, and even in a nation. So I was saying that from the monitoring point of view, the two, sys the two scales can have very different instruments and variables monitored to issue warnings. A review that... Uh, me and my former colleague, uh, colleagues uh, have performed in 2019 were collecting uh, 29 operations, operational lens, uh, uh, local labs. Uh, well, usually these operational local systems, uh, they don't aim to, to publish on journals and papers. So 
it may be that for sure there are more than these 29 operational online, uh, operational worldwide. Uh, but these were the ones that were available information on internet and uh, in literature. Among these ones, what we find out is that 20, 28 out of 29, so the majority of them, are based on deformation monitoring. So they have thresholds, they issue warnings, mostly based on uh, velocity rates, so on thresholds based on velocities. And this is due to the fact that most of the monitored landslides were previously recognized and ha they have shown evidences of active deformation. Now, the, the, a challenge arises if you want to try and well, you, we want to try to define a local lapse or slopes without prior deformation. So, if we want to monitor and set warnings on hydrological things, right? And this is what this project aims at. So it aims to address this challenge, employing an IoT-based early warning systems for cases where not act, there are not uh, there is not an active deformation in place, uh, or at least it's not evident. And we are doing this monitoring and using hydrological variables. But first, I want to start by providing a definition. Of what is IoT? IoT stands for Internet of Things. Here I'm using uh, the definition provided by what is nowadays, what it seems to be nowadays, the most relevant source of information. Uh, but actually, I need to say that the, the definitions provided were not bad, but I had to review the, the text. So what is an in, uh, IoT in general? It's the creation of a vast network uh, where objects can gather and share information, and then this network enables the collection of real-time data, enabling the analysis. But what is IoT in the context of landslide warnings? It's in, it includes the use of different sensors that are, that are hopefully strategically based in the landslide-prone areas, and the aim is to collect continuously collect data, and then to, to uh, make this data available for analysis and interpretation. And these analysis can lead to identify patterns, anomalies, with the aim then to issue alerts and warnings. So we start, I think it's also here, it's pretty clear that we need to have sensors online, real time, continuously con like con con providing data and making this data available, but then we need to interpret this data to do something and then to provide the results of our analysis. So this is what we are trying to do. Uh, and now I'm gonna show you what is the structure that we are using to, and what is the structure we have used to build our, our model. So first of all, I wanna start with a general structure of lens at early warning systems. And I was using, again, literature. Here I provide a small review of how uh, different authors have schematized the main components of a lens at early warning system. On the left, you see what is provided in general for an early warning system, not related to lens in general, from the United Nations, a disaster risk reduction. And then here you see different columns corresponding to, to different orders. Let me use the pointer here. Okay. Then, as you can see here, there are some components that are recurrent. And these ones are mostly monitoring, modeling, forecasting, warning, and response. So this is, from my point of, my point of view, these are the main five components if you want to build a reliable a reliable lens that early warning system. And this is the structure that we have, the framework that we have provided for our for, for an IoT based local lens. We with the aim of uh, doing uh, early warning for potentially stability of rainfall induced lens lights where there are no evidences of active deformations. So we need to have a monitoring, real-time monitoring in place. 
of different hydrological variables, for metric water, water content, for water pressure, suction, and also climate variables, rainfall, snow melting, temperature, so on. Then we need to have a model. So we need to use this monitoring data in some ways. Plus, we need to have uh, input soil hydraulic properties. We need to know them. We need to know vegetation properties, if any, and then soil parameters. Then we can build our hydrological model. We can do a calibration and validation. So basically, we can back calculate what we are monitoring to prove that our model is somehow reliable. And then we can have a slope stability analysis. So this type of modeling, I called it using a buzzword that is popular nowadays, the digital twin. So we basically create a model that we somehow trust that can represent what is happening in our real slope. Then we may use machine learning algorithms to, that can be trained out of the result of the numerical model. And then it can be used in the cloud in real time in a faster way. And then we need, we need to use, uh, we need to forecast climate variables to use as input and then to predict the fact, to predict conditions leading to failure in the upcoming days. And then if there is any stability or any anomalies, then providing warnings that can be SMS, emails, uh, whatever. And then the response we need, if uh, a failure is imminent, then having emergency place, a uh, plan in place and, uh, uh, and uh, action it and, and, uh, and go with them. This is the general framework. Now, how we have used this framework in a practical way. And this is what I'm going to show you. This is our IoT structure. Uh, I need to also apologize uh, because maybe some of these things can may not look so nice. We are still in the process of pro producing the, 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 the final figures for our paper. So this is our IoT structure. This is the monitoring. So we are monitoring different things, different uh, uh, we're using sensors from different companies. And then this can be seen as our modeling part where we use the monitoring data, we get the data, then we make the data available in what I have called here digital twin, which is our reliable model. We used this uh, reliable model, physical numerical model to train uh, a machine learning algorithm. And then, so we have our model in place and then we need to make forecasts. So we need to get climate variables forecasts from the meteorological office, uh, in this case, the Norwegian meteorological office. So this goes in, into as an input into our digital tweet. Then we make the prediction of different things, of hydrological variables and also factor safety. And if the factor safety is, and the, the hydrological variables exceed given thresholds, then we issue warnings. So we receive SMS and emails. This is the structure. This is the IoT structure that we are practically, practically using. And this is how we have employed this, the main uh, components of a lens that early work, so monitoring, modeling, forecasting, and warning. As you can see here, NGI Live, it's the keys, the connection, is the link between all these parts. But what is NGI Live? And I'm going to get take two two more slides about that. So NGI Live, it, we get we get it's a it's a data platform. We get. Uh, Send, um, uh, wireless, uh, we get data through wireless system. And then we have this geo hub that fetch data and store the data and make the data, makes the data available. And then we may use API to, to send, uh, to, to, to run up applications, to run codes, and then to send and to plot the results in dashboards. This is the structure. This is what is what NGI does. 
what we are doing here, in, in specifically, we are getting model, the model inputs are fetched from data API, so we get that, and then the results are published through ingest API. So this is what, what we are doing, basically, as simple as that. And then the digital twin model is deployed as a cloud service using Azure functions, and then it, it's automatically triggered every day. So the data gets updated every day automatically. And then if the code, the code changes, then the updates are deployed automatically in, in Git, uh, Git push. This is what we are doing. Now, let's see how we have done all these things in a practical application, in a case study. So this is the area, you see it on the right, in a very rare uh, sunny day here <laughs> in Norway. And uh, you can see already that it's pretty steep on, on the right hand side. Uh, I forgot to mention that you see pictures of people on the right, top right. It means that these are people that have helped uh, in, uh, in doing different things. So you will see different faces. This is not one person job. This is, uh, we accomplished this uh, topic and these tasks uh, as a group, as a team. So you will see the faces of the people that have helped. This is important, I forgot, I forgot to mention at the beginning. So this is the case study. As you can see, this is the, here is located the monitored slope. And here is a cultural heritage area. So no structural mitigation measures can be achieved on top of this slope. And here there is a double railway line. So at the toe, they have done something to stabilize the slope, but at the bottom, the slope is very steep and uh, it's threatening this railway line at the top. So they decided to start monitoring the slope. This project started in 2016 with the monitoring. And then they have also performed CPTU uh, uh, investigations in, in the points that I'm showing you, uh, ABC. These are the profiles, more or less, so you can see that up to 10 meters from the top, the material is different from 10 meters from the bottom, right? This is clear, you can see it clearly. Uh, the top part is in partially saturated conditions and uh, pressure plate tests have been carried out. And then we have used Van Newton equations to interpolate among points, uh, among the, 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 the pressure plate results. And then we had two different soils. The first one was going from zero to six meters and then the other one from six to 10, and then the third one, which is marine clay from 10 to the bottom. And then on the right, you see the, the values used for the Van Newton equations and also the parameters, the geotechnical parameters used for the constitutive model of Mor Morculo. This is the schematization of the slope. So we have sandy silt on top, clayly silt, and then marine clay. The water table is around six meters. It's fluctuating with season, with seasons. And then you see all the monitoring sensors that are uh, employed. On the right, you also see the, uh, the slope that is heavily vegetated and quite uh, a very steep, around 40 degrees. So what are the sensors? We have four water pressure sensors, piezometers, for different depths. These at the beginning were not in real time that we have transformed them uh, in real time recently. Then we have uh, in green, the square are volumetric water content sensors from, from Delta Link. And then in red are volumetric water content and water potential uh, sensors. And on top we have installed uh, also, a small weather station that can, that uh, measures atmospheric pressure, precipitation, solar radiation, high temperature, and, and so on. So these are the measurements we have on the slope. And this is how it looks like. You can see the two different uh, data loggers that we have, uh, sonar panel, 
uh, to charge uh, to keep power to the sense to the to the to the data loggers uh, and because it's very important for our winter uh, it's very cold and otherwise the batteries will uh, will run out of charge pretty pretty fast these are in detail the, the, the details of the of the sensors we are using geotech pdt a delta link soil moisture sensor this is the delta link uh, data logger teros 21 from the matter group uh, is in indirect estimation of suction this is the data logger volumetric water content and a small uh, weather station now here the challenge our first challenge was okay this different data loggers, they send data to different clouds. So our first task was to get all this data and to put in one single dashboard. And this is what we have done uh, using Grafana. I'll show you now how the, the data look, looks like. I think I need to remove the, the pointer here. Yeah, to run the, the video. Yeah. So we see the location, you see the railway line, you also see the structural mitigation measure that has been done at the top. You see the profile of the slope, precipitation. We also get information from uh, a close uh, meteorological station. Then our data, wind draws with speed and other uh, information. Then here we have for water pressure, and then soil temperature, volumetric water content, water potential, and so on. Everything is in real time. But as I was saying before, having data in real time, this is not an IoT. We, we needed to do something else. So we have done something, something more. We need to do something more. And on the left, sorry, on the left here, you can see the tops that we are having. So map. A tab showing the map, a slope cross section, the data from a, a closest, the, a close meteorological station, and then uh, other uh, variables. This is an example of how the data uh, look like. We have pore water pressure on top, and then we have volumetric water content in the middle, and then soil temperature and precipitation. In this case, we have four years, four years of, of, of data. Then what, how we have done the modeling. So we have seen the monitoring, let's move to the modeling. How we have built our reliable uh, model. We have used uh, a commercial software, a Geo Studios, very well known. Zip, we have coupled analysis with CPW and slope, and we started back calculating one year period. And this is, um, we are considering precipitation and evapotranspiration up here, and then here just precipitation and evaporation. Uh, these are the layers. As I said, the first two are in partially saturated conditions. Then we started our analysis, our back calculation in a given time. This date was the 3rd of June. In this 3rd of June, you have a given volumetric profile in the soil. And you can see in blue the one that we were measuring uh, the 3rd thir of June when we started the first uh, one year back calculation. Then, but the one that we were getting from the Geo Studio was the standard one was this line, the dotted line here in black. And we called this a kind of uh, standard and this simulation as non-calibrated. But we wanted to match what we were monitoring from in terms of volumetric water content. So we tuned it a little bit. And then we had what we called a calibrated uh, kind of start of the simulation, which is this kind of gray uh, line and dots occur here. Then we had these two series of simulation. And what we have done for each of them we have considered in the first case, let me put the pointer again. Uh, we have considered only rainfall, the first simulation. 
then rainfall and climate variables, temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, so on and so on, and then also vegetation. And then the same we have done for the calibrated uh, beginning of our analysis. So at the end, we, have, we had six simulations. And with CPW, we can simulate soil vegetation atmosphere interaction. And the Penman Monday equation have been used for calculating evaporate aspiration and the root uptake, water uptake was taken by Bredes et al. 2001. Um, so we now we wanted to check in this one year back calculation which one of these six simulations was the best in back calculating our our hydrological period. The hydrological variables that we were monitoring. It, it means volumetric water content at six different depths and pore water pressure. Usually in literature, you would see something like that. So you see what you are measuring, the blue line, and then you see the different results of your models that you get. In this case, that we get considering different variables. Well, in this case, I would say it's pretty difficult to define which one is the best. So we decided to use Taylor diagrams for the validation of our back analysis. How tailing stamps works, work? They work in this way. It's a, ra a radar. It looks like a radar. So you have correlations here going from zero to one. You have the normalized standard deviation, zero, one is here and then above one. And then here you have the roof uh, mean square differences. So basically the closest are the dots. The dots are your simulation, our simulations in this case. The closer are, the closest are to, to the dot here, to the reference point. The closer is our back calculation to the, what we are uh, monitoring. So we have computed the, correlation coefficient, the normalized standard deviation, and the root mean square differences, and the bias of the predicted, of the back calculated volumetric water content at different, at six different depths and for water pressure, and we have compared with the observed ones. This is the result of the validation uh, using Taylor diagrams. So we, at the end, Briefly, we find out that with this preliminary calibration, using climate variables and vegetation was the best model to back calculate what we were monitoring. So here is the in situ condition, and here you can see that generally this uh, this CCLV is the the one that agrees better than other simulation at almost all depths. You see it's here. You see it's here. And you see it here, it's the closest one, and so on. Then, to further improve the model and the back calculation or representing the C2 condition, we have performed a sensitivity analysis of, of the hydraulic conductivity of the saturated horizontal hydraulic conductivity, so this value here, for the different three layers, and also the anisotropy of the hydraulic conductivity for the different three layers. So here are the results. Just to point you out some few things. In this case, if you increase the layer one uh, permeability, you can see a faster response of the volumetric. We see volumetric water content here at six meter depth and the low water pressure here. So going from the simulation uh, zero to the simulation one, you have a faster uh, response of the volumetric water content. You can see it here, you can see it here as well. While if you increase the layer two hydraulic conductivity, you have a lower a lower response. This is because uh, six meters is at uh, at the edge between the two, uh, at the bond at the boundary between the two the two layers, and it's where also you have the fluctuation of the of the water of the water table, as you can see from the increasing volumetric water content measurement, which is the blue, with the, the blue line. And here is the whole water pressure, the, the measured whole water pressure.
pressure. And the other continuous lines are the results of our model. And then we took the best uh, model here, and we also changed the anisotropy ratio. And in this case, we can see that uh, increasing uh, the uh, layer one anisotropy uh, ratio also slower lower the response as you as you can see uh, here. Now we defined that the best uh, what what were the best input parameters in, in terms of saturated hydraulic uh, conductivity and the anisotropy ratio. We find out that this number seventeen simulation was the best, and this is the final result. These are in the comparison between the observed uh, volumetric water content at six different depths uh, with the with the back calculated from for one year of analysis. So in blue you see the the the, the monitored the observation, and in orange you see the the model results. You can see that we are. We are satisfied of what we are doing of our back calculation and uh, at the end of our model. And this is the full water pressure at six meter depth where we have the fluctuation of the water table. Now, we have in place a model that we somehow trust. And then we, on top of this CPW analysis, we have calculated the factor of safety in time. And this is how it, it looks like. Uh, I need to remove the pointer to run. So basically, we were uh, fixing the here the, the sliding surface, uh, and we were considering plotting the factor of safety in time for one year of analysis. Then, what else we have done? We have done that, uh, and we have our model that we trust. And we have back calculated all the variables for one year. Then we have done that using other databases. So at the end, we ended up using five years of analysis, three for the past scenarios plus two future scenarios. So past scenarios, it means that we start in a day and then we use as inputs all the climatic and vegetation variables, and then we uh, we run the simulation and we predict and when we and we uh, compute calculate the factor of safety. For the future scenarios, we have used the data from the Norwegian Meteorological Office. They are providing temperature and, uh, and rainfall in the future on a daily basis. I, we know we understand that this can be not so much reliable, but they are doing that plotting uh, and considering that there, there are going to be an increase uh, of uh, up to 15% of more rainfall, and it's going to be an increase also of, of the temperatures. But for us, it doesn't really matter what day is going to rain. For us, we wanted to, in, in, to enlarge our kind of database uh, and then to have a larger data set to use to train uh, our machine learning model. And this is what we did. So we use it, this, uh, this different uh, uh, input of these uh, five different scenarios and together with the factor of safety. And then we divided this into different sets. We used different years for training and we changed the year of the prediction. So what were the, vari the, 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 the variables? The features were the six volumetric water content at the six different depths for water pressure, the rainfall, the temperature and the leaf A area index. And the target was the factor of safety. We tried uh, different uh, machine learning models and we find out that the best one was random forest. So I'm going to show you what are the results. These have been performed uh, by Minu. I guess many of you know her because she was working at, uh, uh, with Nelima at uh, IIT Indoor. And uh, these are the results for the different three different sets. So we have that set one and set three were the best ones performing with a quite high R squared and pretty low value of the uh, mean square error and root mean square error. But at the end, we decided to go for set one to use as model for making our predictions, even if 
even if we have a higher, a, big, a bit of higher uncertainties in the prediction, here what you see, you see the predicted factor of safety of our machine learning trained model, which we call it true, but it's the, the factor of safety that it comes from the geostudio analysis and simulation. So in blue, you see the test, and in green, you see the validation. So even having a higher uncertainty, we prefer we have preferred using this set because this set is okay, is a lower, is a lower R squared, and also because it's going kind of horizontally here and that we didn't like that so much. So we ended up defining picking up this set as set as trained machine learning uh, for making the the prediction in our now just a brief a very brief recap i know i have just not so many minutes left five six minutes what else is needed to make the prediction so we have trained our model our machine learning feature are those ones target is the factor of safety then we have the forecast meteorological data from the region meteorological office rainfall temperature relative but then if we want to make prediction of the factor of safety, let's say for the upcoming three days, this is what we are doing, then we cannot base our prediction on the past hydrological variables. So these are the variables that we need every day, right? To make the prediction for the upcoming three days. So we do have the climate variables from the Norwegian Meteorological Office so what is missing at the moment is the hydrological variables. So we need to forecast them in the upcoming three days and then to put those variables into our trained model in order to predict the factor of safety. How we have done that? Well, in this case, we have used uh, pasta, pastas, um, not because uh, I'm Italian, but uh, just because we think it's a very nice uh, tool to use. It's a, new, uh, it's a new and open source Python package for the analysis of a hydrogeological time series. Uh, and uh, you can see the reference on top right. And at the bottom, you can see a link to the website, which is very nice and, 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 and uh, ex explicative. So transfer function noise modeling tries to explain an, uh, an observed time series. In this case, in our case, volumetric water content and for water pressure by one or more other observed time series. These transfer function noise models can be used to decompose these time series that we want to predict into the contribution of different hydrological stresses that causes the fluctuation of what we are targeting and what we want to predict. And then the contribution of, uh, of stresses to, this, to the hydrological uh, parameters that we are, we are going to predict are computed through convolution and gamma distribution and basically used. I'm going to be very fast on this. If you want to know more, please go and check the, the paper and the website. This is what we have done. So we wanted to predict our hydrological variables, uh, volumetric water content, and low water pressure. These are the variables we have used. So rainfall, temperature, solar radiation, snow depth, le uh, this area index, and relative humidity. And this is the result. So in uh, in black you see what we were monitoring, and in uh, in uh, in uh, blue. It's our back calculation, plus you have the three days forecast. This is what we are actually doing for the six different depths of the volumetric water content. The, the, the black is the observed data, and in, uh, in red is what we are uh, back calculating, plus the prediction at the, at the very end. So this is for the volumetric water content and the pore water pressure. So the correlation coefficient is quite high in many cases, okay in, in others. So now, finally, how we are doing the things? Climate, here, let's imagine that this is the time of the run when we do the analysis. This is now. So we get all the past data. So we have, from NGI, we, 
live, we get volumetric water content or water pressure. And then we have from the Norwegian Meteorological Office, precipitation, temperature, we calculate uh, relative humidity. We put these things into pastas and we predict for the next three days the volumetric water content and full water pressure. That these will, will be used in the pre trained ran, uh, random forest model. Then for the future, we take the forecast of precipitation, relative humidity, and temperature. We use basically temperature and we put into our trained uh, model together with the volumetric water content and pore water pressure. And then we get out the factor of safety. I forgot to mention that in pastas we also use solar radiation and leaf area index, but I have showed I uh, I showed you uh, before, and this is the way how we do the pre the prediction of our factor of safety. This is the final result. Finally, we added a tab which is called digital twin, and uh, this is how it looks like now. And I'm going to, to conclude. So this is the area. This is the slope cross section. We have seen that before. This is our digital twin prediction. And this is the top, the digital twin prediction for the upcoming, I, I've done this uh, today. So this is for the upcoming three days. Nothing is changing so much. It's very cold now in Norway. It's mostly snowing. So it's not re really happening anything. This is the standardized uh, value of volumetric water content over the pressure, and this is the time series of the fa predicted factor of safety. And these graphs are the pore water pressure measured and predicted. And then further down, you have volumetric water content measured and predicted. Let's give a bit more, a look a bit more in detail of what we have. So this is, what we plot, the normalized value of volumetric water content and pore water pressure. So basically it means that values close to one or that exceed one, it means that we have never seen such a high value in the past. Uh, so that's the reason uh, of this radar graph. Uh, we thought it was interesting. It gives you the idea of what are the variables with high, very high values. And then these are the value, the actual values of continuous line what we are monitoring on top volumetric water content and dotted line what we are predicting with the pastas uh, module. And then here is the pore water pressure. So on top is the volumetric water content at the bottom is the pore water pressure. And finally is the factor of safety for the upcoming three days. And uh, well, uh, nothing is changing as you can see. So in the past uh, weeks, the, the factor of safety time series has been more or less stable. We don't have so not, not so much, uh, no rainfall, just snow, cold, and uh, not so much snow melting at the moment. Conclusion, takeaway, first part. We have proposed an approach to define an IoT-based digital twin, local labs, and the importance of using monitored data to back calculate the hydrological condition. So the, important to have, the importance to have a reliable model, uh, digital twin, let's call it uh, this way, that we trust, and the importance of having a calibration and validation. You can find uh, this in way more details in the publication. Here is open access. You can scan the QR code and you can get it. The other takeaway, it will be published hopefully soon. Uh, the possibility to use volumetric water content, so hydrological variables plus climate variables to predict the factor of safety using machine learning. We have used machine learning because, as I said, we are running this automatically in real time and uh, it's faster and easier instead of using the software in the cloud. It would have given us a lot of issues. And then an automated procedures to compute the factor of safety, considering the forecasted climate variables up to three days. And then this concept can be easily adapted to other slopes. Of course, you need to rebuild 
the, uh, the, the digital twin, but the concept and the structure, monitoring, modeling, and forecasting and warning can be uh, applied. These are the references used in this uh, presentation. Extra info, we are going myself, Tina Peternel, Stefano Beriano, and also Nedima Satyam, Samuel Segoni, we are going to convene uh, this session on lens at early warning systems at the upcoming EGU. If, if you will be at EGU, please stop by, reach out, we can have a chat, a coffee, and we can discuss further on these topics. Another thing, I'm, I'm leading this working package eight within the Landaware community. Landaware is an international community of experts in landslides early warnings. Uh, and the, this working group is about IoT-based monitoring and warning, the case studies and pilots. If you want to join, please visit the website, subscribe. It's, a, it's completely free. You will receive newsletters or scan the QR code. You will be updated about initiatives and workshops and so on. This was the last slide. Again, thank you very much for this opportunity. It was very nice for me to present our work and what we have done and achieved so far. If you have any questions, curiosity, please don't hesitate. E either you make them uh, now or you reach out and with emails and I will be very happy to, to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Luca. Uh, it was an interesting lecture. So that's why I call you Dr. Luca, you know, <laughs> because <I can't... laughs> Anyway, so thank you so much. And uh, so we'll have some, uh, you know, uh, interaction with the participants. And uh, yeah. so I was interested with your digital twin uh, model. Like, you know, is it a, at what scale? I mean, you prepare the digital twin of the slope, right? Sorry, can you say again? I couldn't. You know, you were digital twin forecasting model, right? I was interested yeah. to know more about that. Uh, I'll start yeah. with my so uh, is it like you know you made the digital twin of the slope by considering the topo details and other drainage network everything is that what I understood right yeah 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 this is what we have done for the slope and this is what at the end we called it local lens like early warning system at a slope scale so we did the back we were monitoring hydrological variables. We did the back calculation of it. Then we had this model in place. With the result of it, we trained a machine learning algorithm. We are I taking understand that. Forecast, uh, forecasted weather variables, predicting factor of safety. Exactly what, what you say. Yeah. Mm, sure, sure. Yeah, that's very interesting and very novel aspect as in disaster planning and forecasting. Thanks. So I can I request the participants if you have anything uh, so kindly uh, you unmute yourself and you can post your question even in the chat box. Yep. So in spite of a public holiday, yep. several people attended from India also and we have people from BGS and other nations as well. So yeah, uh, Dr. Nagle, I have one question uh, about the uh, Hydrological uh, How are you? Uh, that back calculations. Uh, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> uh, so my question is the back calculation just now mentioned. How it was being done. Uh, oh. sh so I shall put in the chat box. Yeah, you I can shall put in the chat box. The voice is not very clear to me, at least. Maybe if I understood correctly, is how the back calculation has been performed? Is it uh, that something like that? Okay, I can I can say a few words about the back calculation. We were monitoring uh, hydrological variables, volumetric water content, low water pressure. We wanted to build um, on the calibration process. I, I, what I'm reading now. Uh, okay, so what we wanted to make sure is that our model, we, we wanted to use a model uh, to, to kind of represent our in-situ conditions, a reliable model, model that we trust. You can check one we, time. 
we use it we use it uh geo studio and we started with c and uh, uh, we had a monitored period we use it one year and then we were using our uh, we were you know setting the model and the important thing here was to us to define a starting period for our analysis once we start we define the starting period we decided at the end of the well, in the summer season where we thought, okay, maybe the summer season can be seen as a reset for the hydrological variables somehow. So we start from that. But, but then, of course, the calibration process and our first thought was, okay, but then volumetric for the content will have a given profile due to the meteorological kind of uh, situation you had in the previous uh, days. So, uh, this was what we thought. So, and the, and the standard profile of the Geo Studio SIP was that one that I was showing you. So it was not exactly the same that we were monitoring in situ. So we we decided to do this tuning, this calibration of the volumetric water content uh, uh, profile, just to start. We didn't want to start already with a mismatch between the two. And so this is what uh, we did, and, the, and we find out that having a preliminary calibration was better at the end in kind of a back calculation of the of the hydrological variables. Uh, I hope that uh, the, the, the the reply was answering your your question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. It was uh, it was clear. It was clear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Other, other questions or curiosity? Hi, I have one question. Hi. Hi, Luca, I'm Margherita from Pavia. Hi, hi, Margherita. Ciao. Okay. Maybe I missed a thing, but, but uh, why can't we get uh, the hydrolog the three days forecast hydrological parameters uh, only by using GeoStudio model, by inserting the rainfall forecast yeah the thing is um, the thing is that we um, we were not using the geo studio in the cloud this is the the main thing so the quick answer so we are using a, a machine learning algorithm in theory we could have, we could do that practically with geo studio right so you you are thinking that okay why you you haven't done that you can just put the forecasted uh, weather variables, and then you get uh, the volumetric water content at the below the threshold. You could do that. It's a bit more uh, tricky, not automatic to do. Plus, we are not having the software in the cloud. In the cloud, we are having the machine learning trained algorithm. This is the thing. So this is the reason why uh, we, we needed to use something else to predict fact volumetric water content and uh, and uh, and uh, for water pressure, was it uh, was it clear, Margarita? The... Okay, yeah, clear. Understand. That. Thank you. And thank you for the lecture. Thanks. Welcome, Dr. Luca. We have another question in the chat box regarding yeah. sensor. Yeah. What is the sensor type used? Okay, we have. Uh, may maybe I can. Quickly show the, the slide again because it's maybe maybe easier uh, to see what we have. Do you see the screen? Not it. Yeah, it's uh, coming. Yes. Yeah. See it. Okay. But uh, I need to go some some. Very, very, at the very beginning, sorry for this quick going back. Okay, these are, uh, do you see clearly or you see this kind of uh, thing on? Uh, yeah, okay. So here are the, 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 the sensor types that we have, piezometers, these ones. Then we have volumetric water content sensors. These ones, the, the square, this one, we coupled it with the suction sensors and we here. 
<laughs> and then we have a meteorological station. And then we are also getting data from a nearby meteorological station because we feel that the precipitation data from these for, from our one from the from us here is not the best. So we are getting a, another data data set of precipitation from a close uh, rain gauge station. These these are the sensor types, and then these sensor are they belong to different companies as I have shown here. Do you have other questions about the sensors or some specific details you want to know? Or uh, it's, uh, it's clear? So mostly, mostly these are the sensors we are using. Volumetric water content, for water pressure, so piezometers, volumetric water content, and uh, climate uh, meteorological data. It's pretty simple to employ because it doesn't cost so much. If you think that uh, uh, a water content sensor is around, uh, maybe the an average high level one is around 200 uh, euros, but now you can find volumetric water content for much, much lower price. And they are still uh, equally good. Uh, I, I know that Margarita is working on that and. Uh, Perhaps she will, or she has already published something. Or you could, you could double check that. And also a data logger, for instance, uh, it costs around six hundred euros. So it's uh, it's not that uh, that expensive. You can employ these sensors with a very low budget, and you have your slope monitored. It's so another question. Uh, Ah, okay, yeah, I'm not here. How the prediction um, of future factor of safety or slope are uh, verified? Very good, very good question. Uh, we had uh, discussions about that. Uh, and because, of course, we need to know if we are doing things uh, correctly, right? Uh, so we will, at a given point, rerun uh, some GeoStudio analysis in parallel to double check that what we are uh, predicting is somehow uh, correct. So this is what we are going uh, we are going to do. Uh, yeah, but what uh, what we have done and test is that with a calibrated model, uh, the other okay, the other check we are doing is we are doing a check on the volumetric water content and for water pressure. So if we see, so we are plotting it, we can plot it internally with this pasta thing. If we see that we are going like far from what is the monitored value, then we know already that we our, for a, our predicted factor of safety will be off. So this is somehow already an indirect check we are doing, not directly on the factor of safety, but we are doing it indirectly on the variables we use it to predict the factor of safety. So volumetric water content and for water pressure. So we are somehow doing it already. And we will do also in parallel direct comparison of, of factor of safety. Good, very good question. Um, then there is another question. Slopes having drainage channels, how this is, um, taken into account. If I interpret the question here, maybe drain ch channels, you mean, uh, Covid, you can perhaps comment, you mean that inside the slope you may have like preferred way of water of, 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 uh, of infiltrating. Oh, just and... take, um, if I understand well, uh, Govind sir, uh, question is like, uh, are you taking the streamlets, effect of streamlets you know, into your monitoring or in the slope stability analysis. Because when you have, a, you know, drainage or the streamlets are there, so, so which are joining down the uh, the bottom, so maybe there may be some erosion and something like that, right? Yeah, well, uh, we are now considering the, the steepest part of this kind of uh, 3D area. Of course, this is a 2D analysis. This is important to keep in mind. So we are uh, representing and simulating the stability of 
a 2D of one section, which we think it was the most dangerous one, the steepest one. Uh, so we are not, uh, this is what we are doing. We cannot at the moment consider like different drainage, external 3D drainage channels. But if in this case, we are talking of internal preferential way of water of moving, then in that case, we have improved our model considering this anisotropy of the hydraulic conductivity, right? It's somehow to take into account that water infiltrates, but then you may have different uh, horizontal and vertical permeability that can distribute the water in different ways in the different layers. This is the other thing, and we have considered that with our sensitivity analysis, changing both the saturated horizontal permeabilities of the different three layers, but most importantly, changing the, the anisotropy ratio of the three different layers. So playing with the anisotropy, with the ratio of the hydraulic conductivity in the vertical and horizontal direction. Yeah. So thank you so much. So I request if the participants still have anything to interact, so they will contact you. And uh, so yeah. thank you so much. Dr. Luca, and we have Dr. A.P. Singh, uh, who is a honorary secretary of Indian Geotechnical Society. So, I'd like to request uh, Dr. A.P. Singh to just uh, say a few words about the IGS and other yeah. activities. Because you, uh, Dr. Technical yeah. Society is a very large, vibrant society with more than 5,500 members. And very strong right. representation in ISMG also. Oh, right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Luca, for a very useful, valuable, and futuristic lecture, technical talk you have delivered. And really, IoT is going to have a very bright future in the, uh, on the global scenario. Mm. Because this is the uh, only tool which can be used for the remote monitoring. Mm. We cannot reach, but uh, with this help, we can monitor 24 by 7. Mm. So... Thank you for delivering this lecture and uh, thanks to Professor Nilima for organizing this lecture series. And you know, this is the sixth lecture of this lecture series on the field monitoring of geotechnics. And uh, IGS is a very strong and uh, large society. It is having almost 6,000 members, including life members, life fellow and all. And it has completed 75 glorious years. So nice. it had a very glorious past and now going to have a very bright future uh, in the coming time. And uh, it has 53 local chapters and each local chapter is in itself is a body mm. or like a mini IGS, uh, you can say throughout the India, yes. everywhere you, you go to a region, you will find a local chapter of IGS. So that is the visibility in India and globally also. And, uh, uh, IGS is doing a lot of uh, effort and it gave the concept of uh, Geotech Asia. That is the first, that is on the same line of Asian Regional Conference. Mm -hmm. So it gave the concept and it won the first Geotech Asia Conference to be organized in India and Goa in 2025. And uh, this ISSMG has already given this International Symposium on uh, Field Monitoring of Geomechanics. That will be organized in 20, uh, 2026 at IIT Indore under the uh, leadership of Professor Nilima. So very this nice. way we are, yeah, it's uh, moving very fast. And uh, this year we had one, uh, our young members have won three bright spark lectures also from ISSMG. And they have uh, uh, one of the bright spark lecture awardee is already an, is an ex student of your Professor Nilima Satyam herself. So you can visualize how IGS is going to grow and how brightly it is going to organize the things. So hopefully you will come, you will be a part of uh, this symposium in 2026 and very nice. Thanks. The preparation of that. So thank you very much from and welcome on behalf of. I think in next visit you should visit IIT Indore, Dr. Luka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah as, as Professor Nalima Satyam was mentioned before, 
we have many ongoing at the moment projects with uh, yeah. with India. We have uh, uh, I'm leading one of them. Uh, it's called Klima. It's called uh, Not Risk, basically. Uh, and uh, we are. I'm gonna make many many travels uh, upcoming in the upcoming years in, in India, and it will be a good occasion to just make a de route and visiting uh, uh, IIT indoor. And yeah. hopefully we will uh, we will uh, collaborate in uh, in the future in proposals and other. Yeah, sure. Uh, Minu is there. Right. I mean, it's there now as a connection. India is already there in your institute. No? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Luca. You. It's uh, such a nice to interact with you and such a great lecture. Hope to meet you again, uh, host you again. Yeah. At... So thanks again. Okay. Thank, thank you, everyone. Th thank you. Thank you. Dr. Thank you very much. Really, very much to you, to uh, to also Kunal Gupta that was, uh, you know, behind uh, this. Kunal is a student Kunal of. Kunal is there. Going to some okay. this very soon who helped me in uh, arranging this, you know, coordinating okay. all the things. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you all the people attending uh, in the, this national day. Uh, sorry I had to postpone it uh, in December. I was sick. But thank you very much. It was very nice. But the recordings of all the lectures are going to be very useful in sharing the knowledge. So we are posting that in ISMG and uh, IGS YouTube channels, official LinkedIn and YouTube channels. So thank you so much. I'll share the link with you as well. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you again. Thank you, Luca. Thanks for joining. Good day. Bye. Bye.